In this extra of the Rama Blueprints podcast commentary, we hear from Metsi Enriquez, who currently works as a therapist for the San Francisco Department of Public Health. She comments on the series and shares with us her knowledge and approach working in community mental health. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Rama Blue Prince podcast. I'm your host, Socorro Gamboa. We are speaking today with Metsi Enriquez. Metsi, thank you for being here with us. Tell us a little bit about where were you born and raised. And- thank you for having me, Socorro. I'm blessed and humbled to be here and asked for my opinion and my story. But yes, my name is Metsi Enriquez, and I come from El Salvador, proudly born in El Salvador and raised in the Mission District. I was a child immigrant who immigrated here because of the Civil War in Central America in El Salvador, and I arrived in San Francisco right on 23rd and York in November of 1982. I was raised in the Mission District gentrified out about seven times and ended up in Ingleside. I went to all SFUSD and to St. Peter's, which is right in the heart of the Mission District. What are you doing right now for work? I am a mental health practitioner and I am working currently in Department of Public Health, San Francisco, with children, youth and families at Southeast Child Family Therapy Center. So I'm serving kids between the ages of 5 to 18 and their families. I'm a therapist. I ended up choosing this field of work because of the community and because of the teachings that I learned while being part of the mission district community and the youth empowerment movement and the solidarity movement that my family was very much involved in as an immigrant and as a refugee of war. And one of the things that really led me to want to do this work is in what RAP calls alternative, right? The real alternative program. I think the key word in what RAP is, is alternative, right? Is that we know that this world of Western psychology has been around so much that we're learning it, but it hasn't quite worked for our community. And I think that it's safe to say that. And starting, I think, in the 1970s with the movement of ethnic studies and people like Dr. Concha Salcedo and many others that began to actually say, we have ways to heal ourselves. And they call them alternatives, but really they've been around for longer than the Western psychology movement has. Learning to work in the way that I learned while I was working at Cares in Second Chance Tattoo Removal Program, learning just how to organize as a young person in the Mission District, and learning how to organize as an immigrant for Solidarity Movement as a child and as a young person has really given me a lens to be able to work with my people which is the community of the Mission District. And I think that because I am part of the community and I am healing together with my community, I think that's what we should be talking about, is how we are healing each other. You talked about being a young leader, right? And in the 60s and the early 70s, Emuno and Rap focused a lot on developing young people. Do you see any parallels in how the youth leadership movement of back then contributed to your own development? I do. And I think completely. And I think one of the things that struck me the most is the story of how rap originated, how those young people on the corner were asked, what do you need? What do you feel? And what would you like? That is the key to healing. The first thing that we want to heal is to feel seen, heard, and acknowledged. And that's exactly what happened on that street corner on that magical day. Two is that we want to feel connected. And this is something that as families, whether you're an immigrant, first generation, second generation, third generation, we have been taken away from our lands and lost that connection with nature and the ground under us and tradition and culture. And once you tell somebody that their culture is worthy, you're going to have healing right there off the boat. 
The biggest problem in mental health is racism, and that affects us and our communities deeply. And the first thing that I think we need to tackle is that feeling of connectedness, connected as a community, connected with your services, and connected with whatever's going to move you forward. And that's what RAP did. It made me feel connected, even though I was not a student of RAP, all my friends were. And so when I started to do the work, I was familiar with the people that were working with my friends at the time when they needed help. And so I had heard these stories of how social workers helped my friends, and I was familiar with what worked for them and how they felt heard and how they were validated and normalized. And these are all things that are called clinical interventions, but they're not clinical at all. They're ancient. They're part of our traditions. We mm. connect with each other. We love each other. And we are the other you. Tu eres mi otro yo. And we're interconnected like that. Even though we are not, most of us as immigrant families are not in the land that we're supposed to live our lives in. We feel connected through people and through these teachings. Thank you for that. I appreciate your words. One of the things that came out of that movement that Jim Queen developed were the principles of self-determination. So one of the principles is love and serve the people. The second one is youth for self-determination. And the third one is dignity and respect. What comes to mind when I mention those first three? How would you say that those principles impacted your work, your life? Honestly, it makes me emotional because the friends that I did have at RAP all felt really valued like that. They knew why they were there working for community. And it was all about love. And it was about loving community and loving yourself. And that was what moved you and nothing else. What was a key moment in your life that moved you to get involved in social activism? Yes, I've always felt a little bit outcasted because I was an immigrant, because I came from El Salvador and most of my friends were Latinos born here. So they had the advantage of already knowing their language. Their parents knew the language. Their parents knew the ways. And my family didn't quite at that time. But what I did have was the political education that my family gave me because of the endurance that we had in the war. And we were brought here because there was a solidarity movement that was transnational. So mm. when I came here, we were already connected to the solidarity movement. And I was very much raised and educated by men that had been exiled from El Salvador and Nicaragua. And so those teachings very much stayed with me, so much that I had to go to Sunday school to learn political education forever. And so that, at the same time it built me, it outcasted me from what was going on in the community and maybe probably why I didn't get in trouble and I went towards education. I remember my first day at Garesin as a case manager. I sat down with the rest of the staff who were pretty much RAP graduates. And it, we checked each other. They told me mm. I was privileged because I had education. And I told them they were privileged because they were born here. And they didn't have to experience a war. And that marriage of thoughts really catered to what was happening in the 90s. Because they were educated in a whole different way that I was, but we were being taught the same thing. And so we could put all of that forward in case management skills, in services to the community. And one of the things that was happening in the 90s was Mano Dura in El Salvador, in Guatemala. And all of these young men that had experienced violence in the same way that I did, but for longer periods of time, and that came here traumatized, and in order for protection, would join gangs to feel connected. And those were the tattoos that we were removing at the time. And so that exchange between myself and my colegas at the time meant the world to me because we could understand each other in two different ways, but with the same education because the mission was teaching all about solidarity movement at the same time. That's the memory that I remember is sitting with them and having this exchange where I felt heard and I was completely hearing them as well. So I have another question. La cultura cura. 
What does Lakultura Kura mean to you? And how do you utilize this practice? I think there's nothing more healing about learning where you come from and who you are and growing pride from that. And like I said before, racism is the biggest mental health issue that has hit us. And so anything that is about my culture, when I'm told that it's beautiful and I'm validated for it, heals me. And one of the things that I personally heal with is the energies of nature, the four energies, air, water, ground, and fire. And within our culturas, we are taught to respect those four energies and also hold them as part of us and cater to them. And so that is what I heal with, is using that, whether it's an altar, whether it's a person that gives me that fire or that replenishes me with that water or all of that. That's constantly what I'm envisioning in my mind for my own healing. And in order to learn that, you have to learn that that's part of our culture. So thank my you. cultura me cura. Well, I want to thank you, Metsi. And are there any final thoughts that you would like to leave with the listeners? I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody and all of the originators that moved this movement forward in the 70s, 80s, and even before that. You all have really set the stage to grow a really beautiful garden that I've been blessed to be part in. And I hope you all feel that. So I just feel a deep gratitude for all of you who helped heal back then and continue to help heal now. Well, we've been speaking with Metsi Enriquez. Gracias, Metsi, for your work and have a blessed day. The extras of Rama Blueprints podcast are intended to help the listener with a deeper understanding of the people, events, and places that created the Mission District and the series as a whole. Thank you for listening to this extra. And remember, to listen is to heal. All power to the people.